In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I have good news and bad news. The good news is that this morning we are closer to the end of Lent than we've ever been before. The bad news is we still have five weeks to go. For me, right about now is when the realities of my chosen Lenten disciplines begin to assert themselves. It's right about now that the Protestant arguments against fasting begin to make a lot of sense. But then I'm reminded of a line from Lord of the Rings. It would seem like wisdom, but for the warning in my heart. It is now when fasting becomes tough and the path before me seems most daunting that I begin to realize exactly why I need Lent. In Lent, we are called to give up things precisely for the reason that they remain exactly that, things. Man is a religious animal. In his book, For the Life of the World, Alexander Schmemann notes that man is first and foremost homo adoran, man is worshiper, and this comes before man is thinker, homo sapien. As Schmemann writes, all rational, spiritual, and other qualities of man, distinguishing him from other creatures, have their focus and ultimate fulfillment in this capacity to bless God, to know, so to speak, the meaning of the thirst and hunger that constitutes his life. He stands at the center of the world, and unifies it in his act of blessing God, of both receiving the world from God and offering it to God. But in our fallen natures, we tend to elevate the things of this world, imbuing them with a godlike status in our lives. And that's if we're lucky. Far more dangerous is when we elevate ideas, ideologies, and concepts into deities. At least things are real and we can touch them. The things of this world, inasmuch as they are merely things, are neither good nor bad. They just are. But they do act as fuel to the fires that burn within us. And it can be awfully hard to put out the fire with one hand while stoking it with more fuel with the other. But to overcome our tendency towards idolatry, our prayers can be strengthened by periods of fasting. By giving up something good and right, such as eating during the day or an occasional drink at night, we strengthen ourselves and give our prayers a focus and clarity that we would struggle with otherwise. It is there in our prayers, during the seasons such as Lent, that the work of purgation, the emptying and purification of our wicked idolaters' hearts, occurs. It is not the fasting that does this, but our prayers. And And that brings us to our gospel lesson for today. There are many levels to our lesson today, called by Matthew, a woman of Canaan, by Mark, a Syrophoenician. They mark her as a Gentile and an ancient enemy of Israel. Her status as being outside of God's covenant is clear. God entered into a covenant with Israel. Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And the chosen people were to be a beacon to those around and to the farthest stretches of the world. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. But that isn't how it played out. The people rebelled, worshiping other gods. But where man was weak, God was as steadfast as ever. He sent Jesus to fulfill his promise to his people, first through his only begotten son, but encompassing all of mankind. The episode brings this to light in his salvation of the woman's daughter. But on another level, the lesson is very much about prayer, and especially relevant during our Lenten fast. Three times a woman prays to Jesus, entreating him to save her daughter. Her first prayer is met with silence. The second, she is confronted with her unworthiness. And after the third time, her faith is rewarded. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. Silence is the great enigma we must face throughout our lives of prayer. In our encounters with science, we can be disturbed, dismayed, and even crushed. We can feel abandoned, rejected, or punished. But these are merely figments, projections of our own disordered selves. We are idolaters who paste up flyers on a monument or statue, defacing our self-created image of God. The God who meets us in science is only science to those without ears to hear. Attuning our ears, finding the right frequency, is a constant, ongoing process. The God who seems so silent in our prayers is still the same God who gave us life and sustains us in being, in existence. It is he who recreated us in baptism, adopting us as heirs, who died for us on the cross. And so we must take those glue back flyers and nail them upon the cross, killing them in our fasts. The key is to persevere in our prayer. 
Our learning about God can bring us closer to him, but its real purpose is to sustain us when our hearts fail us. Then we can rely on our intellect, our knowledge about God, to continue in our prayer when we would otherwise falter. Fasting trains us in this, providing a framework and a model of steadfast perseverance. If you can weather the inconvenience of foregoing pizza and beer for 40 days, you acquire confidence, small at first, but one cannot build the endurance required to conquer a mountain without first training. Jesus had responded to her first prayer, indirectly addressing his disciples. At the risk of according the metaphor too far, we can liken this to the way in which we can turn to scripture when we encounter the silent response to our prayer. But the woman perseveres in her prayer. Jesus responds with his previous response to the disciples. We have some understanding of why God answers some prayers and performs some miracles. There is a purpose behind them beyond the immediate gratification of some immediate want. In this specific case, Jesus is informing us that his mission was to the house of Israel. But remember, their blessings were to be a beacon and an invitation to all the peoples of the world. Jesus is not saying to them only, I am the Messiah, but through them, I am the savior of all mankind. But this also means, and this is important, that an ungranted prayer is not unanswered. That can be hard for us to accept. Instead, we tend to seek to pass blame, either on ourselves or on God. He doesn't hear me. I've done something wrong. I am important to him. He doesn't exist. None of which is true. Lent gives us an opportunity to work through and persevere in uncertainty, to accept our anxieties, our unworthiness, and our discomforts with a sure and certain hope that they will be transformed in the resurrection. What if God doesn't grant our prayers because in not granting it now, or perhaps ever, he is doing exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think? Should we give up our prayers at this point? It's a bit like asking whether we should give up our Lenten fast just as it become difficult. Yes, God hasn't answered your prayer, and the result, whatever it may be, is instructive, just as the difficulty in fasting is in itself one of the rewards of the fast. I now know myself to be weak, that I cannot persevere without Jesus, but I know that he has far more in wait for me, so why bother fasting or praying? As I said earlier, fasting without prayer is hopeless, and fasting that doesn't strengthen our prayers is useless. The woman from today's lesson does not cease no matter how sound Jesus' explanation is. Instead, she enters the true goal of prayer, not of a spiritual ATM to whom we go hoping we have enough in our account to make a withdrawal. No, she finally engages with Jesus as a person. We know because we have been told that there are three persons in the Trinity, but how often do we engage in our relationship with God in personal terms? The philosopher Martin Buber explains that we experience existence in one of two ways, in an attitude of I, it, or I, thou. When we go to God as only a thing to be worshipped or feared, obeyed or rebelled against, God is an it. Understanding God is what makes him different from other things, and especially ourselves. But when we understand our relationship with God in personal terms, when we realize that he isn't an it, but a thou, we come to understand God and ourselves in terms of our relationship with him. Distinct from the God of theology, the God that we think about as an it, something separate and distinct from ourselves, but as a, one of three persons, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, cannot be conceived, addressed, or even related to without taking into account ourselves. My relationship with Jesus is wholly my own, just as my fast for him, as well as my prayers with him, is far from impersonal. But is at the heart of what it means for me to be a person? What is the ultimate purpose of his death on the cross? To have a personal relationship with not just humanity at large, but with one single, seemingly insignificant sinner, me. In our fast, we begin to emphasize with what it means for God to become man, to experience hunger, discomfort, and rejection. Hopefully, we begin to grasp not only the enormity of his sacrifice for us and his death and humiliation on the cross, but by the very act of becoming flesh. And hopefully, we realize that he did not become a person by taking on our flesh, but instead, 
by taking on our flesh and dying for us, it reveals in some small way what it actually means to be a person. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.